And we're here with Connor Ryan. Connor, what is up? Evan, I'm in a place that usually brings me much joy, which is the Dunkin' Donuts parking lot. But under these circumstances, it's less than ideal. So I have no power in my apartment. So I've been scrambling through all of Metro West to find a place with reception and or Wi-Fi, which leads me to Marlboro, Massachusetts, in which I am now recording from my car. So I've been better. How are you? You've been better. I Well, I, I can't complain, I guess, you know, compared to you, unfortunately, at this moment. It's funny. Last week, Andrew Raycroft recorded in his car by choice. By choice. But today, you're in your car. For, so this is why you should have people should watch on the YouTube channel as well, because as you can see in the background, it's raining, it's car, just everything's just going wrong in this moment, unfortunately, for you. Um, so, yes. But we can hear you and you're here and you're present, so... Uh, that's all that really matters uh, to the people and to me. And so you, you're you're persevering through it. You know, you're you're showing your. This is like Patrice Bergeron in the 2013 Cup final. Yeah, this is exactly. like your groin injury and and your your collapsed lung. You got everything going on right now. So we we thank you for that. Yeah, um, he's gonna grit through it. Don't worry, he'll be fine. Yeah, dr- grit through. Hockey pl- hockey podcasters also can play through injuries too. Um, <laughs> anyways, anyways, I know things are not too great right now for you. Um, anyways, uh, you, uh, we'll start from this point cause we'll, we'll, we'll dive right into Bruins stuff. We're not going to spend t- time talking about Brady when we don't really have to, and every other show in the, in the city is talking about him. So, uh, instead we will actually stick to what our, uh, title is and that's Bruins. Who is the starting goalie? Now I know this is going to be a question. That we're going to keep hearing for a while. Uh, we're not going to talk about Rask at all, actually. Uh, instead, it's Linus Olmark and Jeremy Swayman. And I feel like, you know, Hags wrote a column about this, uh, I believe, on either Saturday or Sunday, in which he said that Swayman should be the starter. Going in, we kind of figured uh, Olmark would get the most of the starts during the year. Or not most, but majority of the starts during the year. But I'm, I'm just going to throw some numbers at you. I mean, through, you know, they both have played about 90 minutes of... Uh, of preseason action, which is not much. Let me preface all this by saying it's the preseason. It's the preseason. It's not a ton of time. But off of what we've seen, Olmark, six goals against on 32 shots, which is an 813 save percentage. Swayman, three goals against on 37 shots, 919 save percentage. I think anyone, I think everyone pretty much agrees Swayman's looked a lot better. Uh, do you see the preseason being the determining factor for why Swayman would start the start of the year? Yeah, I mean, I think it definitely, you know, helps Swayman in terms of making a case for himself as to why he should be the opening night starter. Um, Again, if you look at just the preseason performances, I don't know how you can make the argument that Swayman has not been the better goalie and not just the, you know, maybe the old mark, you know, let OT blunder doesn't help his cause, right? The (laughs) optics of that are pretty bad. But even beyond just that, I mean, you look at just the way that Swayman's played, uh, how good he's been, you know, moving laterally, uh, had some rebound issues in that first, you know, outing against the Capitals, but then kind of uh, fixed that. But Olmark's kind of been a little bit shaky in that regard. He's had a few rebounds that have, you know, gone out to like, you know, the the high slot even, like a lot of dangerous loose pucks that uh, you need to clear. Um, so you look at just the overall body of work, and right now I'd say Swayman has the edge just in terms of how they play. Now, will, will Swayman leapfrog him? I think, one, you have to see how both Swayman and Olmark end this, this preseason if, you know, Swayman has a, a 39 save shutout in, in this game that will have already gone by by the time this podcast drops. But let's say he has a 39 save shutout, then Olmark follows it up on Wednesday with a another, you know, 850 save percentage game. Situation gets kind of tough, right? But I think if both of them play, you know, around the same level, I think for Cassidy going into the preseason, he was talking about how it's to be expected for a guy in Olmark to – You know, start slow, new system, new teammates, new defensemen have to learn communication, which did not work in his favor over time a few days ago. So uh, and also, I think you have to look at just the optics of, uh, you know, a veteran guy, a guy you dropped 20 million on uh, to get beat out for the starting job by a a rookie. Like, again, who knows? Swayman could be very special. He could be the guy who wins the Calder and makes a run this year. But. In terms of the optic, it's almost like, you know, an opening day starter in baseball, right? Like, do you go with the, the proven veteran whose ego you don't want to really hurt? Or do you go with maybe the more talented, younger player? It's like, maybe it's the safe, a safe option just to go with the, the veteran. Because at the end of the day, people don't really care who's 
the opening night starter? What what matters is you get to the postseason and you find out over the span of 82 games who's your best starter at that point in time. And that remains to be seen. But if you ask me right now who gets the opening nod, I'll probably say Omar, even though right now the body work sure seems to favor Swayman. Yeah, and that's the tough part with Swayman is he's he looks so good in the net. I mean, the way, as you said, he moves laterally so well. He, You know, his whole career, he stood on his head, you know, in Maine. Uh, that was his whole time there, was just standing on his head. I mean, you knew it. I knew it from covering the end of his career uh, when he would play UMass. I mean, it was ridiculous. Um, and, I mean, I remember last year, his first game against Philadelphia. Was it Was it 40 shots? Uh, it was close to it. And, I mean, he, he always he's always standing on his head. And I just... I wonder how much that factors into the decision because Olmark is, from what we've seen, I mean, obviously in Buffalo, he was really good in a really bad system and everything. And again, yeah, that, that'll take time to adjust to here. Um, but I just wonder if maybe it's hard to make this de declaration now, but I'm just wondering if maybe they should have went for a cheaper, older free agent goalie, more on the lines of Halak to kind of put behind Swayman in a sense but then again it's like well do you trust do you want to trust Swayman I mean in some ways this is a good situation the only downside is Olmark's making five million a year yeah no I think it's the Bruins by signing on Olmark I think they more or less wanted to cover all their bases I think regardless of you know even if let's say Olmark has a stinker in his last preseason game I still think the Bruins are hopeful that you look at his his numbers production how he fared in Buffalo I still think that they signed him to that contract, expecting him to be a number one goalie down the road once he gets caught up and uh, up to speed. And I think it also goes in line with what they're thinking, not only in terms of having a safeguard in case Swayman hits some bumps on the in the road, which is to be expected for a young goalie. I mean, look at just the situation in Philadelphia last year. Not to say it's going to be the same thing that happens between Swayman and what happened with Hart last year. But, Hart. Uh, yeah, I made sure to, to correct that one there. But... Um, but, you know, in terms of signing on Olmark, it goes in line with that of having insurance for Swayman. But you also have to look at it from the fact that I think the way the Bruins kind of tackle the goaltending situation now, it's very much not a, a – it's a spot where it's not going to be a guy gets 70% of the reps. You have to have two guys who are comfortable even handing it 55 to 45% in terms of reps. And you have to maximize, you know, what talent you have in net between those two players. So – even if Swingman's great, is it the worst thing in the world to also have a legit number one with him? Because I think the Bruins is a good problem to have if you've got a a guy in Omar who lives up to his potential as a number one and a potential Calder, uh, you know, a Calder Trophy, you know, finalist in Swingman. If they're both playing well, it's a good problem to have. The only problem that gets difficult is one, if two grass comes back, which we won't talk about. And two, <laughs> Can't say it. not now. Yeah, and two, when you get to the postseason, right? That's when the issue. That's when the the, the questions get tough, but. In terms of how they're approaching this goaltending position, you can see the rationale of why you know they're hopeful of what Swayman can bring them, along with the fact that they're excited to see what a guy like Omar could do, and that's why they handed him a contract like that. And Swayman can't go anywhere. I mean, did you see the behind the B footage uh, that they got in Alaska? Ridiculous stuff. I mean, incredible. Uh, imagine, I mean, imagine if you're on the behind the B Bruins production team, and you get to go to Alaska every year to go fishing. In, the, in in that area, I you're not trading that guy for McDavid. No. Are you kidding me? That no, guy's staying absolutely. here forever. So uh, I, I do think that Swayman's been the better guy, obviously, through the preseason. But again, it's preseason. It's tough to, to judge that. But who knows? I mean, I could see a situation where Swayman is the hotter goalie in October. And then Olmark kind of takes the reins in November, so to speak. And it's just back and forth. You know, where Olmark kind of gets settled in and he goes on a ridiculous run. So... That's kind of more what I see, uh, but I agree with you. I do think the opening night starter will be Omar. But as we've said all offseason, the opening night starter is not going to be the guy that gets 70% of the reps in net or even 65, you know? I mean, I think the max is like 60% uh, most likely, and probably a little bit more or less uh, than that. Um, tough, tough to say uh, that, you know, but you could say the goaltending controversy is back and better than ever. Speaking of football, Brady uh, Sunday night. Jeez, you were there. Lucky you, by the way, for getting yes. to be there and cover it. And and very that must cool. Have been something being there. Very cool. Very tired. Uh, those uh, eight o'clock yeah. <laughs> uh, games add up quite a bit, but very very cool to be there. Uh, you know, won't spend too much time talking football, but I think the best of both worlds happened. Oh, I guess a win will be the best case scenario for the Patriots. But you know what? Made it competitive. 
Mac Jones had a great game. Brady didn't like, you know, go on a full revenge. It wasn't a four touchdown game. Like <laughs> no. I think everyone left satisfied with what happened. Like it wasn't a worst case scenario for anyone involved. I think that was maybe one of the best case scenarios. Yes. One of the obviously Patriots winning would be best case scenario, but I think one of the best, because again, you know, you don't have, I mean, Mac Jones, he said Mac Jones looks great. Brady was incredibly nice after the game and, he met with Belichick for a while, and he met with Kraft. Everything kind of went well, and it could have not went well. Uh, but anyways, we move on. Jack Sadika, <laughs> same thing. Tom Brady, Jack Sadika, same yes. player. Um, he has impressed through preseason. He's been one of the bright spots. Uh, I was looking at the advanced metrics today. Among all the metrics we love to use, expected goals for, expected goals for, expected goals for percentage, Corsi for percentage, the whole nine yards. He's really good in all of those things. And he's been good. You've noticed him every game. Um, and he's looked the part, so to speak, in the top nine or um, on that second line. But we know that Charlie Quill is going to be coming back. Is he playing Monday night? I forget. No, it's Wednesday, uh, right? Uh, Coyle, not until Wednesday. He'll be in the final Wednesday. preseason it's, game. It's Wednesday. So he's going to have one preseason game under his belt, and he's going to have 10 days before October 16th. It's tough. Obviously, I think Coyle's going to get the first – crack at the second line as he should he's making the money for it he's been around a while um you know you have eric Halla on the second on, on the third line you have patrice bergeron on the first line obviously um you're not going to put sanika on the fourth line it seems like sanika is probably going to start the year in providence but kind of also when a guy goes down on one of those top nine uh, top three lines he's going to step in would you say i'm correct in that assessment yeah, I would say so. And it, it's kind of unfortunate because, as you said, even though I think Stanika's, you know, I think maybe Bruins fans hoping that he was going to go into the preseason and have like a hat trick or he was going to play <laughs> with, with Hall and Smith and put up a few, you know, two point night, three point nights hasn't been there. But it's not as if, you know, as you said, he's been noticeable whenever he's out there. I mean, he's impacting the game, uh, active on the PK, uh, doing the little things. And that's what I think Bruce Cassidy has mentioned multiple times talking about his game is that. For a young player, sometimes the toughest adjustment is just adhering to kind of the fine details of the game and executing in, in them. And, you know, Bruce Cassidy has always mentioned, like, we've got guys we pay that can consistently score, right? You do the little things that help them along the way where it's killing a penalty, whether it's just getting the puck out of the zone. And Jackson Nick has done those things. So it's not as if, well, you know, he's in the doghouse from with the Bruins. Like, I think they'd love to have him up in a spot. It's just where exactly does he go? And – it's kind of unfortunate because Bruce Cassidy, more or less, as you said, kind of shut down potential of him being on the fourth line. But as much as you want to keep, you know, no sick in the middle, like, I don't know if, if you're looking for a spot and considering there really hasn't been a guy on the wing, especially on the fourth line that's really stood up and like taken that job. Like we'll see how Frederick does on Monday, but he's underwhelmed. Like, is it crazy to think that Seneca, if you like open the year with him as a fourth line guy, as this guy, you know, like a, He's not a traditional fourth line checking in guy, but if he's like a, a Riley Nash or something like that, does little things that help out your team. Uh, you know, we saw how good he was in Providence on the PK as a shorthanded threat. Like he has value there. It's just whether or not you want to open the season with him in that role. But you know, what what else is the other scenario? Are you gonna put him down in Providence where he's probably already done everything he needs to do and you're just finding like a spot on the third line? Like it, it, best case scenario, you know, that third line of DeBrusque, uh, Howla, and Felino stays together and continues to play well. Like, it's not like they're hoping for an opening to be there for Sonico. Like, you, I think you have to find a spot for him. And fourth line might be the might be the role. But right now, it doesn't seem like the Bruins are looking at that for him right now, which is kind of disappointing. Yeah, and it's tough because, again, the top two lines are set. Like, those are set pretty much lines. The third line, you went out and signed Eric Howla and Nick Felino, who, by the way, both look great in preseason. Yes. Uh, that pass from Eric Halla to Nick Foligno, that, that sauce was ridiculous. Spoke Z, I think, is still recovering from uh, watching that take place, as he should be. That was a ridiculous pass. Uh, and and you've Jake, you know, trying to revitalize Jake DeBrusque on that left side, so you're not moving him. You know, he's making too much money. So, again, I, it, there, there doesn't seem to be a place. But as you said, Cassidy's been kind of talking down on Trent Frederick to begin – this training camp in the preseason kind of saying he needs to have more tempo. Um, and, you know, it's a debate about Lazar and Wagner. And then obviously went on sign no check. But I, I do wonder, though, as you said, if Frederick can kind of fit in somewhere or not Frederick, Stadnika can kind of fit in on that fourth line. Because, um, again, it changes the identity of the line. 
right? If you can roll out Noshek on the left wing, Sanika down the middle, and a Lazaro Wagner on the right side, I don't hate that line. Like that yeah. that line does and, and again, people forget Sanika's a good two way center. That's not a bad two way center. So he can play those defensive draws. Uh, but again, you don't want to stymie his career. Um, if you're going to project him to be a top six center, you don't want him <laughs> playing bottom six minutes. But again, he's been in Providence for what, two, three years now? Like it's been a while down there. It's not like he's doing anything new um, if he plays there this year. So I, I mean, it, it's it's literally like when you play like be a pro in NHL, it's like, would you rather be like racking up points down in the AHL? Would you like be like the fourth line grinder who gets like PK minutes up at the NHL level? Like, like what, what's better for Sanika's development at this point of his career? Like piling, it's not like a, a Lysel over in Vancouver where like he's going to pile on points. That's great for his development at this stage. But if Sanika's like got 40 points in 45 AHL games, is that going to help him out at this point? Or is it going to be like being a trusted penalty killer, you know, potting a shorthanded goal, contributing that area is like, what, where are you getting the most out of him at this stage where he's 22 years old? Right. So I think you have to find a role, even if it's not, a conventional fourth line role. Cause even Bruce Cassidy talked about it, right? Like his, his, you know, idea of a fourth line, isn't like a, a checking unit of just like a physical group. He said it's a puck possession line. So if Stanik is holding on to the puck, if he's good in transition, if he's helping out on the PK kind of fits into what they're looking for there. Right. Yeah. And the other thing is, this goes back to my point that I've made a bunch of times is you can increase his trade value. If you really needed to trade him, like to, to, to really get something. Because that's that's a chip. If you can build him back up, a few years ago that was your biggest trade chip. If you can then say, "Hey, this guy is really skilled in a you know," if you can put him, you know, in a top six role, he's going to offensively succeed. But now look at what he did for us this year. He killed penalties for us. He played bottom six minutes. He played against the other team's top lines at times and did a good job. So that's another thing uh, that could potentially uh, work in the Bruins' favor and work in Stadnika's favor. Because again, I think that there's a lot there. You just need to find a spot. And the fourth line, as you said, might be that spot. Uh, one center in the Bruins in the Bruins system, I feel bad for is Johnny Beecher, who, according to Corey Pronman, uh, is now out four weeks due to an upper body injury, and he was already out for a good amount of last year in Michigan uh, with an injury. Michigan will not be affected mostly by this because they're that roster is ridiculous. Um, but it's unfortunate for Beecher, who this is important development time that he'll be missing. So. Uh, hopefully he can kind of recover quick and get back out there as soon as possible. Um, other preseason stuff, little musings. Jake DeBrusque has been very good, continues to kind of the revitalization continues to take place. Uh, we've talked at length about that, though. One guy who's impressed me, though, is Mike Riley. Mike Riley's been really good. And I think we said this over the offseason. If you can, you know, we obviously didn't see a full season of Mike Riley last year. Um, but in the time that he was with the Bruins, it was mostly very good um you know give or take that islander series which i guess could be a mulligan for everybody um but what do you what do you see improving there what do you see with a guy like mike riley yeah i think over the span of a full season as much as i think we talked about during the off season of not hesitation like we don't be like bruins don't sign mike riley it's just you, you worry about just the whether it's you know maybe redundancy is the right word or just, you know, the, the reliance on too much of a puck moving group on that left side, as opposed to, you know, an Alexiak or something like that. Obviously that wasn't the case. A lot of those guys got signed even before free agency really started, but um, no, I think you look what Riley brings. I mean, whether it's in transition, whether it's just tangible, even strength offense, uh, which he, I want to say he led all defensemen last year. And I think it was even, maybe it was five on five assists. So like his value there is, great in terms of you know how he impacted getting a Bruins team that traditionally in five and five has not been you know either in the middle of the pack or they've been kind of at the the lower tier of NHL teams so having a guy like Riley helps out in that area and it works out well with a guy like Brendan Kahlo where um, you know Kahlo has mentioned multiple times he likes playing with a puck moving guy and I think in that last game against the Rangers you saw a little bit of how those guys you know playing to their strengths can help out one another because you saw multiple times where Kahlo would get a guy as he crosses into the off the crosses over the blue line, shuts down the scoring chance, separates player from the puck, puck gets over to Mike Riley, pass down the other end of the ice. And you got like, you know, he had that that two on one that he started with uh Marshan and Postenrock, which came off of Carlo separating the puck from a guy down the other end of the ice. So it's not the most conventional deep pair, but 
uh, based on the, you know, what we saw in previous seasons with Kalu and Tori crew, like there's a way that group can kind of work. They both play to their strengths and Riley seems to be a guy that, that is meshing well with Carlo in that regard. So even beyond just the, the tangible offense, I think Riley with Carlo uh, can kind of get the best out of his game. And again, it's not like Carlo has to be uh, like, he's going to be like a, uh, you know, a, a Scott Niedemeyer or something like that. He's going to be skating all over the place. Right. But if he plays through his strengths, but also gets a little bit more, comfortable handling the puck and having a guy like Riley that can pass between them. I think it helps out all parties involved. Yeah. And again, I, uh, Carlo had a nice goal, uh, two games ago, I think. So yeah. it was, uh, so, and, and by the way, you've been back at the garden for these games. I have not been, I, as people know, have a different job with NCAA.com. Go read there. I actually, they let me, they let me rank the top 10 every week, which is great, but funny to me. Um, so I get to, have my own UMass, rankings. UMass isn't dropping, even though that weekend. You, not oh, dropping. You, you, UMass is still number one. UMass is no, still okay. the number one team in the nation. People forget. Just a fluke. Yeah, just just I, actually, it's weird. The games this weekend against Minnesota State got canceled. They didn't happen. Oh, it's really? Weird, wild stuff. It's kind of like the 2015 national championship game. It just didn't happen. Yeah, no, that was that was bizarre. I mean, it I, was I, weird. I, weird stuff. Yeah, it's weird. But no, for the people who want to know, UMass for me went down to five. I thought I was knocking them down a ton. Nationally, UMass went down to seventh, which I agree with. But I was like, you know, two losses, obviously, in Minnesota State, not great, but I'm not going to move them down past the top five. And nationally, they went down to number seven. So whatever. And I so, and I have a different number one than the, the national. So, hey, maybe, I got, maybe I'm on to something. But um, you've been back at the Garden. What has the crowd been like? Has it been good? I know you said it's been pretty loud uh, back there. It seems like people are happy to be back. Yeah, absolutely. I think people are just excited to be back in the building, excited to scream when crazy train comes on, just excited, excited <laughs> to see in-person hockey. And again, we're still in the, you know, there's still, you know, mask mandates and people still have to be cautious, but I think as we get to, let's hope is the tail end of, of, of all this. And I think people are just happy to be back to resuming a, a normal lifestyle. You got people still waiting at line on the hop, and all these other terrible bars over across the street. You got people, you know, nature is slowly healing, I think is what it is. So I think people are just, even in a preseason game where half the lineup's missing, I think people are just happy to be back in the building and cheering on the, the Bruins once again in person. Yeah, it's funny. I was driving into Boston last week, and uh, there was a, a stop on the pike going in, like as you're heading towards Brighton, and just nobody was moving for forever. Like no one was moving. And then we start to slowly move. And then we just keep, we just go. And there was no reason for the stoppage of traffic. But in my head, obviously I was pissed off. But at the same time, I'm like, you know what? Nature's healing a little bit. Yeah. This isn't too terrible. Um, and it'll be fun seeing the Red Sox and the Yankees uh, tonight, Tuesday, for when you guys listen I will, to this. I will be there. Will it's you actually? Week. Yes, I, it's a very busy week for, for yours truly. So I will be there in person covering. You're covering. Not, covering. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I, just, I thought you were just going. No. I, I was like, those are expensive tickets. Um, yeah, I will not be covering that game. I don't think I'll be at it. Uh, but everyone should go uh, follow your work over there. You wrote a great column after uh, the Brady game on Sunday night. And I will imagine you will write something fantastic on Tuesday night. But what can the people look forward to Bruins related? Do you cover the Bruins anymore? What the hell? Uh, I do. Don't, people can relax. I will still be covering the Bruins throughout the season. And so he doesn't care. He doesn't care about the Bruins. He doesn't care. Bruins the fourth team. <laughs> Over at BSJ, do not worry. We will still have uh, a look at, you know, our final look at the, the roster breakdown uh, with kind of that 10-day gap. We'll have time. We'll hopefully work on a couple of features we have on the pipeline that we're hoping to drop for the season stats. So uh, all the daily content you expect uh, as the training camp and preseason winds down will all be over at BSJ. So subscribe to bostonsportsjournal.com. Want to follow me on Twitter? Do that at Connor Ryan underscore 93. Go to all that. And Connor, hopefully you can get the power back in your apartment and get I out of your so. new office. Get out of your yes. new office, which is your car. Uh, but thank you for joining in these ter- tough circumstances. We send our – I'll start a GoFundMe for you if that's, our, if, if that's all right. Thank you. No, you I'm going to get a donut team. now, so I'll be all set. There, there you go. We'll, we'll GoFundMe for the donut. But uh, for CLNS Media, I'm Evan Marinovsky. You Bruinsby listeners, have a great rest.